Well, hello, hello, and welcome once again to another exciting edition of a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show on the Fab Four that uh, focuses on things going on today in the Beatle world. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated radio program called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host, Steve Marinucci of Beatles Examiner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we have a special guest with us on the phone. He's coming to us from Chicago at the Fest for Beatle Fans. And if you happen to att- if you attended the Fest for Beatle Fans back in March earlier this year in uh, Secaucus, New Jersey, he was a guest there. And um, he has a very interesting story to tell because he was a Beatle for a very short period of time. Back in December of 1960, he actually played bass in the group for four live dates. And his name is Chaz Newby. Chaz, welcome to Things We Said Today. And welcome to you, Ken. How are you? We're doing great. Um, Good. Part of the reason why you've been attending the Fest for Beatle fans is that you are friends with Jim Birkenstadt, and Jim is the author of a new book on Jimmy Nickel, The Beatle Who Vanished. And in fact, you wrote the foreword to that book. That's right. So why did you feel, was there a connection that you felt with Jimmy because he was, you know, a, a Beatle for a very short period of time? That was the real uh, motivation. We, I met Jim in London when he was doing his research for the book. He mentioned that there was a certain synergy between our own experiences, myself and Jimmy, but there was also a big difference. I mean, I, I played four gigs with the Beatles before they were known all you know they weren't they really weren't well known in liverpool when i played in late 60s mm-hmm. um they'd just come back from hamburg minus their bass player and pete best who was the drummer then who was a good friend of mine he got me the gig playing bass with them when jimmy played the situation was totally different the beatles had just been over here massive acclaim on the ed sullivan show they'd come back home and they were planning a world tour and day before the tour was due to start, Ringo was taken into hospital, tonsillitis. Mm-hmm. And so, in panic, the organizer, Epstein, they had to find a drummer who was capable of playing the Beatles songs, and Jimmy Nichol just fit the bill completely. I mean, he was a young guy, he was a year or so older than one or two of the Beatles. Uh, he fit R- Ringo's suit, so that... Uh, <laughs> He could sit behind the skins and play, so I understand. I mean, I wasn't there, but I understand he just had a quick practice session with the, of the repertoire they were going to do, and off he went. And in the eventuality, Jimmy played with the Beatles for about two weeks, 13, 14 days, and he played four locations. He played uh, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Hong Kong, and then Melbourne. So there was a, a synergy a similarity between uh, the two experiences. But the big difference, of course, was that in 1960, the Beatles were a local band who'd just come back from Germany, and they were about to start, really start their professional career. In 1964, the Beatles were known all over the world, and Jimmy's experience from a performing point of view was totally different. And Um, the other difference, of course, was when I finished with the Beatles, I simply went back to college and carried on with my normal life. Jimmy was already a very successful professional drummer and then had to find ways of utilizing this newfound fame to his own advantage, I guess. And basically that was the, if you like, the two uh, different stories, uh, the similarities and the differences. And that's what I tried to put into the forward. Not to get too, too far ahead of the story, Chaz, but the the beat, uh, Bill Harry suggests in his uh, Beatles Encyclopedia that there was actually some um, beginnings of Beatlemania when you were with the band. Did you notice? I mean, was there something happening in the audience? Uh, oh, sure. Beyond the... At the time in England, the most popular band professionally, you know, in the hit parade, would be Cliff Richard and the Shadows, and the influences from the U.S. at that time were, uh, if I can use the word emasculated, Bobby's 
you know, Bobby Vinton and Bobby V and Bobby Rydell. In other words, uh, rock and roll appeared to have been cleaned up from the from the, the rock and roll that we first heard in Liverpool in, in the mid fifties onwards. Sort of thing. And the Beatles were, if you like, trying to go back to that classic rock and roll of Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly and Elvis and Carl Perkins and Eddie Cochran. Whereas the other local bands in Liverpool were tending to try and keep up with what the trends were in 1960. So if you can imagine, uh, the other bands would turn out on stage, they would be wearing suits and shirts with ties, and they'd be doing little dance steps on the stage to accompany the music. The Beatles turned up, black leather jackets, black leather trousers, cowboy boots, and proceeded to uh, repeat the sort of show that they were doing uh, in the clubs on the Raper Barn, the Mac Show, mm-hmm. jumping up and down and stamping on the floor and uh, generally creating mayhem. The Liverland Town Hall gig that you're talking about, that was a, a dance hall, right? So people went there to dance. The band that was on the stage was not important. They just provided the music for the people to dance to. And when this bunch of five guys, because at the time it was Paul, George, John, Pete Best and myself, when the curtains opened, Paul launched into Long Tall Sally raucously, and every, all the amps turned up to full power, uh, full power at the time, which wasn't very much. You can imagine it wasn't uh, what the audience were expecting. And, uh, and I think that's what sort of created the change. So the dancing stopped, and the people came, gravitated towards the stage to watch this performance rather than just listen to the music. You, know. you always hear about that Litherland Town Hall gig, which is where apparently uh, they transformed into this tremendous band after three months, three and a half months in Hamburg. Were you a fan of the Absolutely. Beatles prior to that, and were you able to observe what it was like before they went to Hamburg as opposed to when they came back? Well, before they went to Hamburg, that they were, uh, they'd done one professional tour, as I understand it, they played in Scotland as a backing group for Johnny some of Gentle, the sort of uh, upcoming singers for one of the upcoming singers. What was his name? Johnny Gentle. Right. Mm-hmm. I didn't see any of that tour, but I remember my first uh, contact with the three of them was in um, the Casbah Club in the August of 1959, when they were still called the Quarrymen. So I knew that they could play, but they they were uh, how shall I say? They weren't significantly different from any of the other bands that were playing at the time. Um, It was the the consequence of their sort of long stay in Germany, that four months from August through December, and the the sort of constant playing, the sort of four or five hours per night. And I think that they gelled into really, musically they gelled into a tight outfit. And I think when, for instance, when the first gig they played when they came back at the Casbah Club, every, that was a private members club. So everybody in the place knew who they were. And everybody had seen them there before. And what they weren't prepared for was this sort of uh, professionalism that they sort of absor- absorbed during their four months in Germany. And so that that's... That was the, I think the Casbah Club was the start of people's recognition that the Beatles had changed from being just a, any other band from Liverpool into something special. Hmm. And that message obviously got across to Liverland Town Hall, and that was the demonstration of uh, really the people uh, in the north, north end of the city. That was really the first time they'd seen uh, the band play the way they could. Yeah, I'm always reminded of when Paul has talked about what made the Be- uh, the Beatles different from other bands. He was very proud of the fact that the Beatles would often listen to B-sides of singles and play those because he didn't want to repeat the same songs that other bands were doing if they were on the same sure, bill. Sure. So were you uh, exposed to that kind of thing with, with different material that the Beatles were doing at that time? And also, even early on, even in the Quarrymen days there were those early Lennon-McCartney songs that once in a while they would do. It wasn't all covers. Did you do any of their original material? 
No, I, I, I had never heard them do Lennon and McCartney songs uh, up until the time I played with them. It was all covers, as far as I was aware. Okay. I later read and knew that the material existed. It's just that I never heard them perform it. What were some of the songs that you guys did do? Well, the, the repertoire was basically the same for all the four gigs we did. We opened up with Little Richard, Long Tall Sally. We always finished with the Ray Charles, What Did I Say? And uh, In between, there was uh, Wooden Heart by Elvis was a popular song at the time, and Paul sang that. They also did a range of um, Carl Perkins songs and a range of Chuck Berry songs. Uh, roll over Beethoven and Johnny B. Gerd and rock and roll music, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the, oh, there was one version, the Ray Charles, the, the Eddie Cochran version of the Ray Charles song "Hallelujah, I Love Her So." I remember they did that on the four occasions. Right, <laughs> pretty good. Now, before joining the Beatles, weren't you in Pete Best's band? That's right. Uh, yeah, the Blackjacks. Black yeah. Yeah. What was that like? Uh pretty much like the other bands yeah. playing the, the same covers? Sure. We were playing all the same material. Well, mostly, you know, sort of 80% of the, the songs we sang were the songs that I played with the Beatles. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, was, it was the same the same source. You know, it was the classic American right. mid to late 50s rock and roll. And mm -hmm. uh, we played all the Carl Perkins songs and the Buddy Holly songs and Eddie Cochran and Chuck Berry just the same as the Beatles did, you know. Did you ever get to know Stu Sutcliffe at all? Unfortunately, I, I never met Stuart, because obviously the reason I was playing with him was because he was still in Germany, and then by the time I think he came back, I'm not sure, but I think he came back temporarily in February 61, and I'd already gone back to college by then, so I never got the opportunity to meet him. Right. Did you... Um did Pete talk to you after he got fired from the Beatles? No, no, no. No, he didn't. I've known Peter since I was at school, you know, and uh, we, we've never discussed it. He's never brought the subject up, and I've never asked him. You've remained friends with him to this day? Absolutely, yes. Yes, we played. I mean, we played rugby together. We played in the same band. The, uh, in 1999, when they reopened the Casbah, after closing, Bill Barlow and myself and Kenny Brown and Pete got the Blackjacks together, and uh, we played a few songs at the reopening as well. And Bill Barlow and myself, since the unfortunate passing of Ken Brown, uh, Bill and myself have been up to the Casbah a few times since. Oh. And we're going at the end of this month as well. Very nice. It's nice yeah, to hear that. Nice. Okay, the so. thing is, I guess, uh, you know, the world in general looks at Pete Best and remembers Pete Best as the guy who was the, the drummer with the Beatles. But to us, he's, he's just the guy we knew at school. And, you know, we played in the same band and we're still friends with him and he's still friends with us and we know his family and he knows our family. And, you know, it's a different level of uh, association, I think. Is the story true uh, that um, John Lennon asked you to join the Beatles? Well... This seems to come up all the time. I can't imagine in my I mean, I, I read about all this uh, much, mm -hmm. much later. John, I think, and this is only my personal opinion, so please, it's not cast in concrete, but okay. I think John was simply trying to encourage other people to get out to Hamburg. That's what I think now. I, I don't think he was inviting me to replace Stuart, because Stuart was his closest friend. Mm -hmm. The reason Stuart was in the band was because of John, and I don't think John would have tried to uh, weaken his position in any way. Now, at that point, this is a very interesting time when you played with them because it was like an interim period, as far as bass players are concerned, because, now, correct me if I'm wrong here, at this point, did Stu decide that he had left the group because we know that he wanted well, to I pursue... Well, I don't know, because I never met Stuart. Well, did, uh, didn't the band yeah, tell you anything? I, I'm only going on information that I've read, you know, sort of 30, 40, 50 years later. So I'm, I'm, I have no idea what Stuart's motivations are, were at the time. I mean, I, I know that he stayed in Hamburg. I know that he formed this friendship with Astrid and that she was a photographer at the art college in Hamburg. And I'm sure there were times that he, he was considering his career as a muso or as an artist, but 
I have no details on that at all. I, I just don't know. It's only what I read subsequently, yeah, that he wanted to go back to the painting and and Paul took over playing bass. So at no point when you were with them, they ever discussed with you what the status was of the band as a as a bass player. It's just not, like... not that I was aware of at the time. No. Okay. I, I think John, he definitely said, you know, you should get your ass into Hamburg because you know everybody's enjoying it. So uh, now whether I don't, my personal opinion is that he wasn't directly inviting me to be the bass player in the band. I think mm-hmm. he was simply trying to expose it to other people so that. Everybody else could get on the wagon, you know. Oh, Chaz, just for the record, you were playing bass. What was Paul playing? He was playing a six-string guitar. He was just playing rhythm. Rhythm? Uh, it was, uh, now, let me... I'll, I'll say, a Rossetti Super 7. You know. <laughs> uh, and he just... Uh, he, you know, he just reversed the strings on it and played it left-handed. Hmm. Did you sense any frustration with Paul that, uh, I mean, this is only four dates that you were with him, so it's hard to even judge, yeah, but yeah. This, is a, this was a guy that really didn't have a, a role in the band in the sense that John was really the rhythm guitarist and George was the lead guitarist, and Paul would play rhythm along with John and occasionally uh, play piano in the group, but he didn't have a strict role, so did you sense well, at all that... I think it depends what you define by strict role. Nobody else could sing like Little Richard. Mm-hmm. And uh, I saw Paul as, uh, at that time, you know, the three of them were the vocalists. And it never occurred to me that he didn't have a role to play in the band, I must be honest. No, I'm only... I'm thought, only... Uh, the band was like a, a collective, if you like. I'm only thinking in terms of, beyond his voice, what his main musical instrument was to be. I, I really couldn't comment. I, I, I didn't hear any uh, comments one way or the other. I mean, I knew that he played the piano, and I've seen pictures of him from a time in Germany where he's playing the piano and Stuart is playing bass. But no, it, the subject didn't come up, and I didn't imagine there was a problem there. Did he ever show interest in the bass? When not you were that with I'm him? aware of, no. Well, certainly did, not in discussions with me. He simply told me what the chord progressions were, and I just w- watched John or George playing the guitar to see when the key changes were off the run. Could you talk briefly about their personalities in the band at the time, um, how each one related uh, related to you and also related to the audience? Well, I, they were all very friendly to me. I mean, mm-hmm. as I said, it was Peter who introduced me to them as a band, I knew who they were anyway, and they knew who I was. Um, so I, I didn't have problems one way or the other. You know, they would bear in mind uh, this is not the famous, world, well renowned Beatles that we think of today. This That's is right. Four guys who were just enjoying themselves, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was a temporary bass player. So I, I can remember going back to college in January and talking to people, and they were saying, you know, well, what did you do over the holiday? Oh, I went to visit my parents in London, or I went to visit. And when they asked me what did I do, I said, well, I played bass for the rock and roll band. <laughs> and it, it was literally at that level. You know. mm-hmm. That's wonderful. That's, in, in the context of history, that's, you know, that's fantastic, too. Absolutely right. But then you see, <laughs> uh, they weren't born famous. You know, they, they, they achieved uh, their renown simply by the hard work that they put in in performing and writing the songs. But when when they were 18 and 19, uh, there was no hint of that yet. Mm-hmm. Right. I, would love to I have suppose that's, that's the nicest memory for me, because I knew them when they were just normal guys having a ball. Yeah, I would love to have a recording of Paul singing Wooden Heart. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, I was impressed with his singing, actually, I must admit. Because I, I do remember that Liverland Town Hall gig when he opened up with Long Talk Sally. And as I say, Liverland Town Hall was a ballroom, the dance floor. And the curtains were drawn, and Bob Wooler, who got them the gig, I believe, he was on the microphone in the middle, and he was just about to say, you know, ladies and gentlemen, direct from Hamburg, it's the fabulous book. And he just about got to the letter B, and sort of Paul nudged him out of the way. And uh, off we went into the long, tall salad. 
That's wonderful. Well, that's a great picture. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it, it's an image that stays with me. I I can remember that yeah, they were stamping around and playing all this sort of classic rock and roll music, and I was the only one who didn't have the cowboy boots because they bought all those in, in Hamburg before. I was wearing normal shoes. You know. At the end of the gig, my feet were hurting terribly. How long did they play? Well, I have a guess. And this is memory, so I've no uh, concrete evidence. But I have a guess they played about uh, 10, 11 songs, that sort of thing. You know. So maybe half an hour, uh, 40 minutes, that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, Chaz, are there any photos of you at the Beatles? Because I, I myself haven't seen them. It would be nice to see you in some photo with the others. I have never seen photographs taken uh, on those four gigs, no. Uh, I don't have any photographs of me with them. The only thing I have is a pastiche that was issued by the News of the World newspaper when it existed over here in the mid-'90s, and they took a photograph of the Beatles and then they took Ringo's face out, and then using sort of computer graphics, they put a, my face on top of Ringo's body. But I mean, it's totally fake. You know? mm. The only person I imagine might have had photographs from that period would have been uh, Paul's brother, uh, Michael. Because Michael was into photography at the time. Right. And uh, I'm sure he, he took photographs at that time. Whether I was in them, I have no idea. But that, that's the only thing I can think of. Have you had any contact with Paul in recent years? No, no, no. Did you have any... The only one of them uh, that I've... Since 1962, I saw them. uh, Last time I spoke to them all was in 61. um, There was a riverboat shuffle with uh, uh, Akabilk's jazz band on the River Mersey. And I I saw them then and spoke to them then. But since then, I've I've not spoken to them. I met George briefly in 1962, but uh, only to say hello to and how things go and that sort of thing. You know. Was music something you were ever seriously considering for a career, or was it always just a fun thing on the side? Oh, it was just a fun thing. It was just a hobby. And, uh, I mean, it was a very pleasant hobby, and I did enjoy it, but I never, I never imagined myself or desired to be a professional musician. You know. that's, that's That's wonderful. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great, it's a great story. It really is, and, and especially well, against the against the, you know, the tension and everything that that seemed to happen with Jimmy Nickel. Yours is such a happy story, you know. Absolutely, um, yeah. Well, I think that was one of the motivations that Jim had for getting me to write down my thoughts. You know, that it, it was apparent from what Jim's research, the Jimmy Nickel experience, that mine was totally different, and. Um, I think that was the, if you like, the counterpoint. Uh, on the one hand, the similarities, and on the other hand, the, the differences between our is, the two experiences. Is Jim's book the long, the first place that you've put down your experiences, or do, have you put it put them down in a longer form somewhere else? No, no. But I've spoken to you know, many of the uh, the Beatle authors, if you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's. And I've written, occasionally I've written, you know, a page uh, for various people. But no, the, I must admit, the forward, I took some care over the wording, shall we say, just to make sure it was absolutely right. And it was something that Jim could use for his book, because I realized how important it was when he first mentioned it. You know? Right. I didn't want to sort of appear flippant or noncommittal or ignorant of it. I, I, I just sort of, I wanted to put it down exactly as I thought. And uh, as I say, I, I just outlined what I imagined would have been the similarities and then sort of the counterpoints of the differences. And uh, Jim seemed pleased with what I'd written. And uh, it just went from there. And, uh, and as a result, I've been on two trips to the U.S. this year. So. <laughs> yeah. I've got a lot to thank Jim for. Is is one of the people you spoke up? One of the authors, uh, Mark Lewison. Did did you? I assume Mark Lewison talked to you about in, in, in the process of putting his biography together. Mark Lewison. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, well, yes, I, I I've been in contact with Mark, and uh, he knows that I've written the forward for Jim's book. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Mark was talking about you, Chaz, back when he wrote the Beatles Live book. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, he mentioned well, your was, name to me back um, then. I I got in touch with, sorry, Mark got in touch with me immediately after Peter's book had been published, which was, oh, I might be a year or so out here. I think Pete's book was published eighty five, and I was chatting to Mark Lewis and shortly afterwards by telephone, and then eventually we met and you know, had a much more involved discussion. What was it like? And I've been in touch with Mark ever since. So. Yeah. What was it like for you to observe the Beatles' massive success being the biggest band in the world? Was there a time when you said, I well, can't to believe... To be honest, I, I, was, I was really pleased for them. I mean, the chances of a band from Liverpool in 1960 making it successful, a success in the UK, was, the odds were all against them. Mm. I mean, all the business in music at that time was centered in London. And all the acts, all, all the bands seem to, to have come from that area of the country. And certainly all the record producing was done there, all the music publishing was done there. And, you know, looking back, I, the Beatles, and particularly the influence of Brian Epstein, they overcame some hurdles to get the Beatles recorded and then to get the records distributed. And the, the success they achieved was totally deserved and on the one hand I was pleased with them on the other hand I was quite surprised that they'd managed to jump all these hurdles and get through all these hoops you know? mm. and I, I think it's a credit to their, their work I think uh, and to Brian Epstein's intervention you know that they eventually did manage it right but to hear all the music that they came up with as a band how amazing yeah. that that catalog is you got to oh, sure. take a look at that and say, wow, you know, I, I was in a band with these members and, and I knew them. It, sure, it, must sure. have, it must have blown your mind to know that they were capable of coming up with so much incredible material. Well, sure. And, and of course, one of the reasons was that they were just so driven uh, and they were just so determined to succeed. Um, yeah. I've spoken about this with, uh, you know, friends who were there at the same time, Bill Barlow, who played guitar with us in the Blackjacks. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when, when we were 18, 19, we, we'd sort of made a decision about what we wanted to do with our lives. You know, the, some people wanted to run their own business and be plumbers or electricians or whatever, and some people wanted to go to college and become lawyers and doctors and chemical engineers and physicists. Some of the people wanted to be teachers. These guys, right from the off, wanted to be professional musicians. Mm -hmm. And that, that didn't seem odd at the time. In other words, you know, everybody was deciding what to do with their life, and they just decided on this particular route, and other people had decided on different routes. And the, we were talking about it quite recently, Bill and I. The odd thing is that we all achieved our target. You know, we all achieved the objectives that we had, <laughs> which is quite remarkable, I suppose. But. Now, you went on to study what, exactly, Chaz? Chemical engineering. Okay. And are you still doing that now, or? No, no, no. I, I retired years ago. I retired in '98. Uh, what's that? Fifteen years ago. Okay. I, I've been a pensioner for fifteen years. The, the last ten years of my life, I uh, I went back to university and did a teaching uh, qualification. I, I taught mathematics at a high school for <laughs> the last uh, few years of my life, working life. Okay. But I, I've been retired for a while now. Well, good for you. You 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 did you did exactly what you wanted to do. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I'm not saying that you know, uh, sort of boasting about it. It's just that that was the way we felt. You know, that this is our life. That this is the experience we've had at school. We were all, you know, so certainly most of the people I knew had gone had good education. You know, had the opportunity to choose. Oh, this is where I'm going. I'm going to open my own business. I'm I'm going to become a reporter on a newspaper. You know, we had the choice of what we were going to do, and most of the young people that I was in the social group of at that time in my life, you know, they they sort of achieved those things that they wanted to do. You know, become nurses and doctors and school teachers and plumbers and professional musicians. Well, we've just about run out of time here, but we want to thank you, Chaz, for joining us and, and telling us your story hey, with my, the Beatles. My pleasure, my pleasure. And thank you, Chaz. When I get home, when I get home, and I talk to all my muso friends at home, you know, and I, I don't live in Liverpool now; I live in 
the middle of the country, you know, in a little rural area. And uh, we go down to the pub and have a few beers and uh, have a good laugh about it, you know. Uh -huh. I tell them I've been on these radio programs in the United States. <laughs> well, this is actually it's the Internet now. Beg your This is the Internet now. It's not just the United States, so... Well, of course. It's <laughs> worldwide. Yeah. You can hear us anywhere. That's okay, right. well, I'll, I'll expect a message from Mars quite soon. <laughs> well, that might happen. You never know. <laughs> You're dead right, it might, yes. You know, we, we, we attract a, an unusual crowd, I think. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I, I'm happy to be attracted to your crowd. And we're happy thank, that you joined us. Thank you again, us. Chaz. This has been, this has been very, oh, this has been wonderful. It's been very enlightening. Okay, I, I'm, I'm pleased that you enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. So, for the Beatles, things we said today... This is Ken Michaels thanking you for joining us, thanking Chaz Newby for joining us, and we'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you, Chaz, for, for spending some time with us. Uh, we had a wonderful talk, and we will see you next time.